Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out of the very bustling afternoon at Reinforced Day One. I'm Erin Sindelar, like Jeff said, and I hope you aren't bored in the next 15 minutes enough to go over to the on-air booth, even though it has sounded like a really great time. Today, we're going to talk about um, a really interesting conversation that comes up a lot when we talk to customers about their digital transformation journey. We hear all the time this very common thread that development teams and security teams really struggle to communicate when they're talking about cloud native applications. This isn't necessarily a new problem. It's something that has always been a disconnect, but it just continues to widen the more a team is developing or the deeper an organization goes in the cloud. Let's start with the cloud journey itself. What does this look like? And how does it continue to build more of a disconnect between the two teams? Most of the customers that we work with are functioning in uh, a lift and shift as their first step. That's how they start a migration, and it's pretty simple and straightforward for a security team. Most things still work the same. Almost everything works the same, really. So it's pretty easy, but organizations quickly realize that it's not cheap to rent a server. So they start to auto-scale. This is awesome for application teams and developers. It gives them a lot of opportunities. They're able to programmatically deploy workloads and have a lot greater velocity. But the security team might have their first speed bump. They are dealing with a different kind of environment, and they need a new type of tool that can scale and be programmatically deployed in the same way as those workloads. It's uh, also good for them, because they don't need to be paying for a security tool 24-7 if the resource that they're trying to protect is only live for eight hours a day, five days a week. So it's really good for everyone, but it's the first time the security team needs a different tool to match the different technology being deployed but this really isn't the fun part yet for the developers. The real fun comes when we explode the VM and start using new compute methods. Containers and serverless functions are fantastic. They also come with separate storage and networking. And these applications are built using open source technologies with API-defined and event-driven architectures. This is really the biggest learning curve for a security team. They have to have completely different tools for each of these resource types, because none of them work quite the same. Your entire thing isn't contained in the four walls of a VM. Everything needs a separate kind of security, and different types of security controls apply. So there's a lot to do from the security team's perspective. And throughout this journey, an organization is also adopting managed services. The first one, most probably, is uh, IAM. Because if you've ever started a new AWS organization, you almost certainly had to use IAM, because why would you not? That would be crazy, right? And the more you're developing in the cloud, you're likely going to need additional managed services. Maybe it's streaming services or a database. And each of those, again, needs separate security controls, because they all function differently, and they need to be protected from different things in a unique way. This is a lot. In this really varied environment, most people aren't just using serverless functions. They're likely using a variety of these compute methods, and they need a variety of security tools to match that. So a cloud-native application protection platform comes into play. You'll likely hear that from nearly every vendor on the show floor, even though it's a lot less prominent than I expected it to be. But it essentially just means that this variety of compute and all of the different resource types can be managed by a security team from a single type of tool. It also comes with different governance and guardrails requirements to help everyone scale and build in a secure manner that meets the needs of that organization. A lot of organizations even develop a different team that's responsible for this. The Cloud Center of Excellence functions as that guiding light to help the business transform continuously and make sure everyone is doing it in a secure and compliant way. So as we go through this technology evolution, I hope it's clear where the technology root cause is that divides these two teams. But it didn't start with this technology like we talked about earlier. It actually is rooted deeply in the different missions of these two teams for the organization. On the one hand, developers are responsible for creating value and solving customer problems. That's what they're focused on. Doing so in the cloud just lets them do that with a lot greater velocity, so they're able to solve more customer problems and do it quickly. That's great for them. Where they get the reputation that developers don't care about security is really because 
uh, the tools and processes don't work for them. It's not that they don't care about security. They need their stuff to work, and they need it to work consistently. But when the tools get in their way, that's a problem, because it goes against their core mission of delivering value fast. On the other side, the security team is responsible for protecting the finances and the reputation of the organization. To do that, they need to know what's being built and deployed by the developers. But when the developers own the inf infrastructure and everything being deployed in that infrastructure, they have no idea. <laughs> it goes into production, and then they find the things that need to be fixed. So this is the core problem. We have two teams with occasionally conflicting goals that both have a vested interest in the same application, but they have no common way to talk about it. They don't know how to look at the same thing through the same lens, which is where their problems arise. In practice, where security being disconnected from development starts to creep in and be a problem, if a vulnerability is found in production, it's not likely that it was introduced in production. Your service provider, AWS, didn't put it there. It's likely an outdated library in our own code. And that means a developer could have fixed it a long time ago if we had known about it. And there might have been a developer tool that could have seen this earlier. And maybe the development team uses this, but they missed this one. So it got to production, and it introduced risk, so the security team now cares about it. But it could have been fixed a long time ago. Additionally, adding to this challenge, if a security team finds something bad, whether it's a misconfiguration or a secret or malware, they respond to everything in the same way. They find the owner using a CMDB, they issue a ticket and assign it, and it sits in a queue. And because the security team has no context or understanding of what that resource is, they don't know the business context of where it belongs and the application within which it's operating. So it can't be prioritized. If there's 100 tickets sitting there, and 98 of them are in our internal applications that are never going to impact anything for a customer, but two are critical and in the million dollar an hour application, they'll all sit in the same queue, and it doesn't make a difference. And that's really a problem. And I don't want it to sound like security is at fault. So far, we've really looked at the disconnect from the security perspective, but I am a security person at heart. It's not the fault of security. Security has shown from vendors a list of resources. That's what they see in our application box here. That line is where they view issues. So if they can't see where the source of the problem is, how are they supposed to know how to prioritize it against the other 100 tickets? But when we talk to security teams, the customers of Trend, they talk to us about the application. They don't think about the list of S3 buckets or containers. They think about the application that is responsible for millions of dollars an hour for their business and the impact to the business reputation and finances if that went down or was breached. Yet we show them, as security vendors, a list of resources that don't have any context to help them prioritize for their development teams. So this starts to give us a picture of what this could look like, despite the natural separation that some things are happening in the development side, some things are happening in the runtime side. Both teams have different interests in these two sides. There's a single platform that looks at the entire application to give both teams better information that can help their missions and be related to the application. So they have a common language between the two. That common language really comes down to the most frequently overlooked piece of the CNAP definition as Gartner defined it, and that's bidirectional feedback. If that's not a term you've heard before, don't let it be scary. It often kind of freaks people out when we start to talk about it. It just means that there's valuable security information on both sides, both environment types within this application or that impact this application have valuable security information that could be shared between the environments. Developers could absolutely use security information from the runtime environment if they could have it. And obviously, the security team could greatly benefit from knowing what the development environment had going on. So that bidirectional feedback is really the foundational answer to what creates a single view of an application that both teams can use to communicate. Let's look at this in practice. We'll start with a really easy one. Everyone's familiar with misconfigurations. And if we have an application that has an S3 bucket, 
that has an open configuration. It's read-write, and it should not be. It can be found with a CSPN and fixed. And maybe it uh, has an auto-remediation rule, so this can be programmatically fixed for this type of issue under certain conditions across the board. This is really expected for a security team, and it's very normal behavior. But wouldn't it be great if this could be fixed with an IAC scanner in the development side instead? Both teams are actually really well aligned on this, because for a development team, if they're already working on the application, they would much rather fix a potential issue at that same time rather than going through the cognitive load of going back to it later when it's found in production by the security team. And from the security team's perspective, obviously they would rather the issue never present risk to the organization. They don't want it to ever get to production. So if the developers can fix it before it's an issue, cool, everyone's happy. That's a pretty simple setup. But to get a, just a smidge more complicated, what if there's malware found in a Lambda? This isn't the most common scenario. We have seen it, and I was really glad to hear it on stage today during the keynote, uh, since I obviously knew I would be mentioning it later. If there's malware found in a Lambda and the security team flags it with a developer, cool. Given a single set of information that both teams can use to make a decision, they're able to see how this malware got there in the first place. Where was it passed in? How did it sneak into this Lambda function? And does it just impact this Lambda function? Or does it actually impact hundreds of others? And the fix could not just fix this one function, but the hundreds of others that are impacted by the same shared library. This just saved loads of time for both teams, because they could actually talk about it in a way that makes sense for both of them, so that each time the malware was come to by the security team across the other 100 functions, they don't have to issue the same ticket over and over and over. Like maybe eventually somebody would figure it out, but they'd have to be really paying attention. If the tools can just do it for them and actually give complete pictures, that would be so much better. Lastly, in an application, a new vulnerability is disclosed. A CVE is posted from an open source library. The dev team knows that that library is something they use, so they're impacted by this bug. There's a patch. That's great. They start testing the patch, and everything breaks. It completely takes down the staging environment of their application. So they know that they can't obviously use the patch immediately. This application is important to the business. So they share this information with the security team, and they're able to use an IPS rule to mitigate in runtime to ensure that the CVE can't be exploited. That gives the development time to actually remediate the issue because they can't use the patch that was given when the CVE was disclosed. So that's three different scenarios where this bidirectional feedback not just saves time, but gives both of the teams the information and the understanding that they're able to better execute their missions for the organization because they can simply have more productive conversations and eliminate a whole bunch of conversations about an application or a list of resources because they don't have the same context. I know that was really quick, and we talked about a lot of things, but four takeaways from our time together. It is completely expected that as an organization adopts more cloud-native technology and different commodity compute, they will need different security controls. Security is not inherently bad for developers. Developers really care about security. There's a fantastic talk from Reinforce last year and reInvent last year from my friend Madeline. I encourage you to find it. It really digs into why security matters to developers a lot more than we have time for today. But the answer to solving this communication problem and bridging the gap between these teams is bidirectional feedback so that they have a shared understanding and insight into the issues from both sides of the environment. The single application rather than a dev tool and a security tool. And this doesn't just create a different conversation between developers and security teams. It really changes the game for the whole organization. That highest level executive who's been the champion for digital transformation sees the greatest return on their investment and can prove the value of what they're doing for the business. And the application owner, who at the end of the day is responsible for the customer value that the developers are building, they can deliver with greater velocity and do more for their customers. Thank you so much for your time today. I have really enjoyed the crowd. I'm impressed with how many people are here. Um, I hope you learned something. Enjoy the rest of your time at Reinforce. And if you have any questions, I'll be around at the Trend booth or around here for a few minutes, um, or find me on social.
Did I click the wrong button? Sorry. <laughs> I went that whole time without doing that. <laughs> uh, thank you again.